So, let's have a serious talk. I have been wanting to rank enemies for a very long time, but there were some problems. The simplest one was, how do I rank them? Am I supposed to consider only the battle? Am I supposed to consider also where they are in the overworld? Am I supposed to consider the items they drop? And most importantly, is it really fair to compare boss fights to normal enemies? Imagine inserting in the same rank system the God of Destruction and the Scarab. After a long time I finally decided that today we're gonna rank purely the bosses. But this brings another question, what is a boss in Fear and Hunger? Because the concept is pretty debatable, so I decided to insert a sort of selection here. An enemy, to be a boss, needs to have at least one of these things. The soundtrack is The Four Apostles or Pulse and Anxiety. Using a soul stone on it gives you a soul with the name of the opponent, and also it is not unkillable and the battle is not just a glorified cutscene. This gets rid of opponents like Naja, for example. So, with an accurate analysis, the bosses are these. Rest in peace, old knight. But be happy, there is one simple reason for which the Soulstone does not tell you the name of the old knight. That's cause he protected his personal data, because this video is sponsored by Surfshark VPN! As the name suggests, Surfshark is a virtual private network. It is able to encrypt all your data to protect them from anyone. Companies, cyber criminals, even the literal king of thieves isn't able to steal anything from you with this. As you know, data gets leaked every single day, exposing people to potential threats or invasion of privacy. Surfshark is also able to scan your credit card, your email or even your ID and will be able to tell you if your information got exposed in any way. And that's not all! You want to play with your friends while traveling abroad? Change your server to the place they are into and now you can! You live in places where games are very expensive, now you can change to somewhere with cheaper prices. And this doesn't stop to games! Is there any type of content blocked in your country, it can be on Netflix or on other streaming platforms, by changing your server location you can get access to it immediately. And if you want to try Surfshark yourself, you can do it right now using the link in the description and by using my code for Apollo 94 With this you will also get an extra 6 months completely free. You also have a 30 day money back guarantee, so there is no reason to not try it. Thank you so much once again to Surfshark for sponsoring this, and now let's go back to the video. Let me precise, we will analyze the boss, not the boss fight. Which means we will also consider other stuff related to them, mainly the atmosphere created. But anyways, this is every boss ranked in fear and hunger! I will not follow any particular order with these boss fights, but I think it's better to start with the one that may potentially be the first boss you encounter. The Cave Mother. Let me try to recreate how the first time you met this creature probably went. You and the girl finally reach the blood pit and there is a big hole in the ground. Intrigued by it and still not knowing a lot about the possibility of dislocating your legs by jumping, you jump down and you dislocate your legs. You start crawling in the darkness still confused about what just happened. Will I be able to to heal my legs, or are they just gone for the rest of the run? And as you are wondering about that, you hear something. You freeze for a couple of seconds, but it's already too late. Once you try to go back, something approaches from the darkness. And now the battle with the cave mother starts! The battle itself is pretty elaborate to be honest, she shows you even more the importance of targeted dismemberment on opponents, because as hinted the breast is what is causing the cave gnomes to come to her, and the wings give you an alternate way of defeating her in case you don't go for the torso. And she is also pretty generous in being one of the first bosses, since she has a chance to just not do anything by tilting her head, giving you overall more time to just relax or to think about a plan or to restore your health, you know? And also her damage is not high enough the despite being able to cut off limbs, which will probably allow you to defeat her even without healing and without anything else on her first try, but maybe at the cost of some limbs, which will make you in the long run understand you need to find a way to deal with this. And you know, potentially, it's better if you defeat her on the first try. You know why? Because in that way, you will immediately realize how this game messes up with your hope. Victorious you want to immediately search for a way to save, but as you go back... 
she comes for you again. Phase 2, baby. You know why I love this passage? Because you even have time after the first phase to potentially heal yourself. This is the game literally telling you to take advantage of all the pause moments to be ready for adversities. Because everything can go wrong in seconds. This phase 2 is a weakened version of the first one. You already know you have to defeat the breast so you're even more prepared. But overall I think the cave mother is a fantastic boss. Both in the atmosphere created when you jump down and in the boss fight itself for the majority of stuff it teaches you. Also if you defeat her you can loot an item which is the gnome egg which will be relevant later on for another boss battle. Even the reward is fantastic of this boss. And because of that we start today's tier list with a solid A tier. But I'm pretty sure some of you may be debating the fact that the cave mother could be the first boss. After all, there is another boss you can encounter before that. In the basement, you can find the roaming around the Iron Shakespeare. Let me try to recreate the very first vision you may have had of the Iron Shakespeare. Are you ready? After dying multiple times by going into the entrance of the dungeon and dying to the guards, you decide to go through the basement. You surpass the tentacle creatures because they are pretty slow, and you finally arrive to a weird room with gravestones. And suddenly, it opens up to a big room with a lot of light? Light in this dungeon? That's already kinda sus. And suddenly, you see him walking. Being able to catch a glimpse of this opponent so early on creates the possibility of powerful opponents being always hidden in the dark and increases the necessity of being careful to everything no matter what. And now let's jump into the battle! The battle itself is... Uh, uh, what can I say? It deals massive damage and has a gimmick in which uh, he burns his hands with, uh, I think, the fire that is present in the room. And this is done to deal even more damage and burn, but uh, not my favorite battle, to be honest, because you just end up skipping it until you have enough damage to one turn kill the torso. And there is even no reason to go for the hands, because they have much, much more health than the torso. Should, uh, sh should I say it? Should I really say it? It reminds me of Fear and Hunger Termina battles, okay? You just ignore any possibilities of a path and you just go for the torso. So yeah, the atmosphere is pretty decent. Also, the fact that there is darkness in the room makes it so that sometimes, even though he is really big, you will not be able to see it until you get very close. But the battle is bad. Oh, and there is one last thing I want to say. If you search him after the fight, you get the cell keys F3, which opens all the doors in the prisons. That's cool, right? If only there wasn't a guard in the prisons which already drops them! What... what was the developer thinking? Okay, you have a 50% chance to steal an empty scroll, but uh, is this really the standard reward? A recycled key? Just don't make him drop anything at this point. I'm gonna be generous and give him a C tier for this. But now it is time, you know it was coming, the emblem of the dungeon, the Crow Molar! I am sure that if you think about Fear and Hunger, he is probably the first opponent that comes to your mind. The first interaction someone may have with this is the crow bed in the basement. After sleeping safely one time, from the time afterwards there will be a coin flip, and if you fail it, the crow molar will battle you. Alternatively, once you go below the surface of the dungeon, he will start following you in almost all the rooms before Mahabre, creating a constant sense of urgency and needing to pay attention to not waste any second before he appears. Also, there is a confirmation of torture chambers, which is a reference to Pyramid Head from Silent Hill, where you can catch a glimpse of the Carol Molar behind the bars. Oh, and did I mention he can also break some walls? These are all great premises. I love the amount of love the developer put into this opponent. And the fight itself does the same thing. You fear it the first times, as in a few turns he is able to pack insta-kill the whole team, so you feel the need to escape every time you run into it. The battle overall is also pretty simple, only two limbs are able to do something, the molar arm which does decent damage and applies fracture, and the head which can blind or decapitate someone. But despite the simplicity, you need a lot of preparations to do this battle consistently. You will need iron mask, red vials, if you really want you could also reach 100% evasion with butterfly soul plus defense stance to be able to always dodge the pack. I am amazed by the amount of creativity you can have to deal with this boss. Very good both before the battle and after it. And also, yeah, defeating him gives access to the miasma, but uh, I won't really change my opinion based on this, because not only there are easier ways to get access to this sword, but also I tend to come across people that consider this sword the holy grail of weapons of this game. You have to get a guard, it's better because uh, he's the good miasma user, miasma is crazy! Listen, listen, okay, it's an okay weapon, the only real benefit is being 
bring one extra guaranteed single-handed weapon that you can find. But it's definitely not the Excalibur people are thinking about. Also, you don't even need Legard or the Skeletons to use it technically, because you can just unequip it when passing through the Miasma spots, or just have enough mind to not having to deal with the Miasma spots. Ah! Sorry, I am just really, really frustrated by this weapon at this point. But sure, you can go ahead in the comments and tell me, what do you mean, for Apollo? It's literally the best weapon, you don't understand anything, you're a stupid idiot! But regardless, the Chromola is the first solid S tier. The next one I want to talk about is the Salmo Snake. You know when they say a picture is worth a thousand words? In this case, a shiny item in the water surrounded by mutilated corpses is worth one million words. It clearly conveys that you shouldn't touch anything, and if you do, you will have less than a second to realize what you have done. Great introduction of the fight. As for the battle itself, the Salmo Snake gives a whole other perspective on blinding the enemies. And in this fight you're able to do that without needing a red vial by killing the little eye he has, which will then cause the arms to attack less often. And even though you may think this is just stupid or too simple maybe, but it's an intuition passage that your brain needs to understand. Because it's not always gonna be so simple, and the sooner you understand it, the better. The other peculiarity is the tongue, which slowly goes out to the then do each turn a coin flip attack, which insta-kills you. You know why I love the tongue? Cause not only this can be controlled by attacking regularly, but you can also place a dot on it like poison, or if you recruit Moonless, which mind you was 30 meters before this point, she will almost always first attack the eye and then afterwards will attack the tongue, placing sometimes bleeding, which is a dot, therefore nullifying the tongue immediately. The possibilities to deal with this are a lot and open up a lot of space for experimentation. But wait because there is the cherry on top, are you ready? Talk to offer the gnome eggs we got from the cave mother before, and this will cause the Salmo Snake to not act for two turns in a row, which also opens up a choice. Am I scared of the cave mother cutting my limbs off, or do I defeat her to have an easier Salmo Snake? Or do I defeat the Salmo Snake to use a soul stone to get the Salmo Snake soul to protect me against the limb loss, and only afterwards defeat the cave mother? Decision making is the core of these kind of games, and having more decisions available is fantastic. Good mood, good boss fight. A tier. The Black Witch is very difficult to rank, honestly. She has a very unique way to be encountered in the basement with the flip side basement. Basically, if you walk into very specific spots, you will be teleported into her domain. And after the witch appears three times in a row to laugh at you, she will finally decide to attack you, giving overall plenty of time to be able to escape the basement if you want. This seems to me more one of those situations where you have all the time in the world to escape, but then you go like, wait, what if I don't escape? Also, I think I should mention, if you're playing on Terror and Starvation or Higer, she also can spawn from small ritual circles in Mahabre in the present. And coincidentally, these small ritual circles are very similar to the one you find in the basement where she teleports you. But I think we should jump into the battle. The battle is pretty straightforward. It can introduce you to understand what those powerful magic like Black Orb do in case you find her in the basement. And I appreciate this is one of the only bosses which actually allows you to gain value from having stuff such as the Soul Devour Necklace, which increases your magic protection. Which is also vital to player to finally understand that they need to adapt their equipment to the opponents. But apart from that, uh, it's very simple. She just hits very hard. I don't know, she seems like Iron Shakespeare too. Basically, you just fight her once you know you have enough damage damage to be able to either kill the arms and then kill the head, or just rush for the head, or just use, I don't know, black orb on the head. At least that gives a little bit of strategy that you can just black orb the head at the start. But not really much else to say. I'm gonna go with the C tier. But I guess it's time to delve a little bit deeper into the dungeon and to go into the city of Mahabre because it's full of bosses. And we're gonna start off with the Skin Granny. This boss introduction is not incredible, but not even bad. You enter in what appears to be the old Ragnavalder house in a dream, and you see an old lady working with a spinning wheel. But trying to approach results in her starting a battle with you. At first you may think it's gonna be very easy, but something's off. And soon enough, you will understand why when she reveals her true form. 
Now the real battle starts. And the battle itself is... Like the introduction. Not incredible, but not bad. I appreciate that on the very first turn, you can do some minor setups, such as using a fast stance, brown vials, or even healing in case you were damaged and forgot to heal. Or you can also summon the blood golem if you want. The second phase introduces a state you may already be familiar with if you saw the night lurch. Critical state. So you already know how it works and understand immediately the problematic parts of this battle. The arms. I also appreciate that in Terror and Starvation difficulty, she has four arms and only one legs, incrementing technically the difficulty, because you have to deal with more arms at once. Oh, and there is also a coin flip attack, but honestly, it's kinda bad. Yeah, she declares it by flexing her fingers, but apart from that, you may end up not understanding how it works. Let me explain, this coin flip is an insta-kill. If she uses it, she will rip the face off of a character and wears it. Pretty cool, considering also it's unique to this battle, but there are some problems. Some characters just cannot have their face ripped off for uh, reasons. Like there is the, the marriage, why can't you rip off the face of the marriage? Or the, the girl? Or the goals? It ends up being a little bit bizarre and inconsistent, and even though it benefits the player because hell yeah, she used the face rip on the girl and nothing happened, wow that's fantastic, I still find it bad. So yeah, I'm gonna go with B tier. Since we just did the skin granny, I think we can continue with the new gods. Let's go to Valtail. Let me recreate once again the experience, shall we? From the moment in which you enter in the Grand Library in the past, you see some eyes in the walls continuously looking at you, never breaking contact. The more you traverse it, the more eyes are present. And at one point, after you realize how to solve the puzzle of the library, you can see a figure briefly looking at you, right before jumping into the darkness. As you descend the long staircases to reach it, you can see a giant figure floating towards you. But you can't really hear anything. There is only your heartbeat in the darkness of the library. And eventually, you descend the staircases up to a point where the darkness completely surrounds you. And then, the battle starts. Honestly, pretty good start for a boss fight. And the battle itself, I love how he uses the two sides of the brain, one of the logic and one of the creativity, which is exactly how it's supposed to work in real life. Logic uses physical violence and creativity relies on magic powers, such as hurting and black orb. Also, it's relevant to mention both the sides of the brain can skip turns because they have to think about what to do and elaborate the situation. And this gives you some time to breathe and to think more about what to do yourself. But not too much because there is a third enemy, the third eye. It will slowly develop along the fight, and once it reaches the final stage, it will cast Whispers of Garogaroth, causing, in the course of five turns, the death of one of your party members. You can either kill the third eye immediately, or hurry up and win before you lose. I genuinely like this battle because even with the worst RNG, you can still triumph with some solid setups, such as magic protection and pheromones. Also, you can just poison the head and wait, but Valtail is literally the guy from the Earth actually meme, and does not accept the existence of someone having more knowledge than them. So if you try to talk and answer their quits show correctly, then all the body parts he has will take 500 damage each time, basically rewarding the knowledge you have about the lore. Good mood and good battle. It is a well-deserved A tier. Alright, we are finally arrived at him, my man, the tormented one, Ron Chambara himself! After reaching the Temple of Torment, you will realize there is no way to proceed unless someone goes on the chains to spin the wheels of the machine. It can be a party member, which will reduce the amount of available people for the upcoming battle, therefore requiring you to think even more carefully about what to do. Or, if you were lucky or had Nasha in the party, you probably were able to create the husk and beat this first puzzle for the battle. Once someone is on the chains, Chambara will keep following you, similarly to the Carol Molar. You can either pay attention and dodge him perfectly every time, or just lure him away, or fight it immediately to finish the puzzle calmly. Fighting him will also make you understand a little bit more about the upcoming battle. But anyways, after all of this, the blood starts to flow. While you approach the exit, it's finally time for the real fight to start. From the pool of blood, something arises. He is back, baby. The first phase is basically identical to the one near the chains, so if you fought him there, you already know what to expect. One of the only cases where defeating both arms will make the opponents much stronger, because he will start casting a Chains of Torment immediately. Also, you can take advantage of this phase by using some setups such as Fast Attack or the Blood Golem, because the damage he does is very minor, but the second phase is where your knowledge can shine. 
The three wheels. All of them either deal a considerable amount of damage or spin, giving you more time. The simplest way to deal with this is to jam in the same turn two wheels in order for Chambara to lose his balance, take more damage and have zero evasion. But you know what I love? I love that dependently from how much knowledge you have, the fight goes from being a desperate attempt at survival to be the perfect proof of how even the battle which seems the most hopeless can become a complete joke with enough preparation. You can put a dot on Chambara in phase 1, this will cause phase 2 to lose HP periodically. Also, magic bypasses Chambara evasion independently from jamming the wheels. Going a little bit deeper, you can put a dot on the wheels to jam them every turn, therefore making Chambara a joke. And joy of joys, you can have a party member being a tank with the highest defense possible, guarding, you're gonna take almost no damage each turn, even from an attack as scary as Chains of Torment. I love this battle and everything regarding it. S tier. And be careful, because it's not over yet. Once you finish this incredible battle with Chambara and you go out of the temple, there is something weird. Where is the music? You slowly walk to reach the temple district, but uh, wait. I am almost sure there was a body here when I came through. Am I going uh, insane? Oh, no, I'm not. He's walking. Wait. He's walking! I love this introduction because you're able to see him before the battle itself and also because it destabilizes you immediately once you see him walking. The battle is not bad. The wings deal high damage, which means you still need more preparation after Chambara. You cannot let your guard down whatsoever. He also can use both the wings simultaneously to deal even more damage and has a coin flip attack with a unique death animation in which he literally slices you in half, even if you have the penance armor on. And before you say, wait for Apollo, but isn't this just another Iron Shakespeare? No, because not only you have to pay attention even to the arm loss mechanic with the wings attacks, but also the wings have a decent amount of HP which allows you to kill them with enough preparation. And you can also kill this in a very special way by killing the heart. The heart has a very high physical and magical evasion, but you can trivialize it by using stuff such as Black Orb or even the Murky Vial, which bypasses completely evasion. Or of course, if you feel lucky, just normal attacking. <laughs> It adds a layer of rewarding for experimentation, which is always appreciated. Good atmosphere and good battle. Once again, not enough to be in A tier, but a solid B tier. Now we can go to the last new god, the Franço... Eh? Yes? Yeah, tell me, tell me. Did... Did I miss someone? Oh. Oh. Um, so, the nameless figurine... <laughs> How do I even start with this? So, to challenge this... Uh... Moron, you need to have already defeated Valtail, Skin Granny, and Chambara to collect their soul. And I know you can get the required souls in other ways, such as uh, defeating your party members and using soul stones or using empty scrolls, but regardless of that, this boss is still one of the last remaining creatures who are guarding the literal throne connected to the void. And what does he do in the battle? He attacks. And attacks. And. Attack. It's like a mini Iron Shakespeare in terms of damage, but with a little bit more HP on the torso. They are literally the same thing, and for what you have to do to challenge it, the battle is poor. The epic battle you're expecting because you have to triumph on three new gods to face him falls entirely during this battle. I don't like this one at all. The battle ruins any possible sign of tension you may have had prior. And on that note, it's even worse than the Iron Shakespeare one, because the Iron Shakespeare is at the entrance. This one is in the literal ancient freaking city. Absurd. F tier. And before you say something like, oh, but for Apollo, they are ancient golems, it's normal that their battle is somewhat lackluster because they had to stand still for years. That's false, because I'm gonna show you the old Guardian now. The introduction of this one is very good. You first meet him in the past. He's apparently waiting for the king, the one that built the city to come back. And then, if you go into the present in the old passage, you're able to see a figure on the bridge. It is the old Guardian again, almost discouraged by the fact that the king didn't come. And then... It challenges you to a duel. A meaningless duel in the middle of a forgotten city. This reminds me kinda of Guile, to be honest. And I love Guile, so I love this introduction as well, a lot. And the battle? The old Guardian is literally a Tekken character. He throws boulders, attacks you with arms, uses legs too. You know what's the difference between the Nameless Figurine and the old Guardian? The old Guardian doesn't just always use the same attack with both body parts and just stand still. This actually has vitality. You feel it's funny to fight it. You never know what to expect. A boulder? 
older, maybe the next time he's gonna throw at me a palace or something. You know what's the only downside I see? He has a very low health on the torso for being in this zone. And unfortunately that may cause it so you actually don't see any attacks and just skip the whole battle, even non-intentionally, but I can't not consider that. So I'm gonna give it a B tier, but a very well-deserved B tier. But hey, now it's time for the last new god, Francois, the dominating one. The one that is sitting on the throne in the Golden Temple. The best part is, the one that lets you access the Golden Temple in the past is his present version. He too wants you to defeat him. After taking the key, you then traverse this long corridor with fire coming from the ground. No enemies, nothing, just a build up to the climax of this final battle. And then in the last room, you can see him sitting on a gigantic throne with a stoic pose. Mwah! Chef's kiss! And the battle... D depends. L let me explain. The scenario gives you the possible feeling that Francois is gonna use some sort of fire attacks because uh, it it's all fire, and he even has a very cool second phase in which he covers himself in gold and uh, starts using fire attacks with also the torso and the head. Then, what is the problem? that I have to give a big penalty, and unfortunately I think this is gonna go down near the Nameless figurine. Because if you talk to him, and you select the correct answers, he will not attack. And you can repeat this forever. I know you may say that a new player doesn't know of this, but I never said this was only from the eyes of a new player. Once you know about it, there is no reason to not do that. This is not a boss fight. This is not a trivialization of the fight. This is literally clicking buttons. You are not using a crazy strategy to be able to block the boss. You are just mashing some buttons with no heart whatsoever. Maybe you may think I'm a little harsh, but this is a disgrace. This could have been the coolest fight in the whole dungeon. Unfortunately, it's gonna fall in the F tier. But feel free to tell me if I was too harsh, of course. But for the time being, did you like the Crow Molar? I hope so, because now we have Crow Molar 2! The Gauntlet is already one of the most dangerous zones in the dungeon, and hearing the Crow sound after falling off a hole... ...is one of the most terrific things possible. What? W what is the Crow Molar doing here? Did he follow me? Wait! He has two heads! Perfect start. The battle is the Caramolar, but with two heads. I mean, it makes sense because it is the Caramolar, it's the same enemy, but not much changes gameplay-wise, and I think recycling the fight, adding another head, and that's it, did not make it anything sensational. Don't misunderstand me, I too went like, oh wow, it's the Caramolar with the two heads, whoa! But after the starting enthusiasm ran off, it just stopped being interesting. B tier. We almost arrived to the final bosses, there are just two more entities which are kinda related we have to talk about. The first one is the Greater Blight. So, you sit on the Golden Throne, are thrown into the other plane of existence and missing all your party members, except the ghosts and the skeletons. While you walk to search for them, you hear some steps. The steps come closer and closer, faster and faster. You feel like you have to hide. But you are not able to find any holes in the ground. And so, the combat starts. I love this introduction also because there are ways to prevent it. For example, if you jump into holes, the presence will start slowly walking away. But anyways, let's go to the battle. The battle has a peculiarity. In the very first turns of the battle, you are completely free to set up yourself, because the dinosaur is still far, far away. You can use fast stance, defense stance, create the blood golem, use pheromones, heal yourself if you want. Or, after you're more experienced, not only you can realize you can poison him using purple vials, but also you can realize that magic is able to hit from the distance. Mastering this a little bit, you will be able to kill him before he even gets closer. Otherwise, it's gonna be a very terrific fight. He does incredible damage. But the preparation time you get is enough to deal with anything. There are also some bugs related to it, but overall pretty funny. B tier. And the last creature before the final bosses is the Flying Blight. This creature patrols the other plane of existence, and if you don't pay attention, it will eventually attack you and start a mortal battle. There is a problem! I bet almost no one of you even knew you could actually fight this. You know why? That's because fighting this is very hard in the sense that starting the battle is very hard. You have to be in the exact tile in front of the face of this creature, and if you miss it, you have to wait until the Pterodactyl does the whole ring around the rosy loop of the dungeon. Now, 
This is not necessarily a negative point, also because you may consider this one of the situations where the prize itself is realizing that you can fight that creature, but you are forgetting something, this is MY video, and in that case I consider it just a tedious start of the fight. And the fight itself is... okay... The wings deal massive damage, but have low HP, allowing a prepared party to remove them immediately. Also, the head can cast pack, but has low HP, so if you want, you can use Black Orb. I don't know, this battle is just... why? We already have in this same zone a good build-up battle which is the Greater Blight, this is too weak to be the Crowmoller remake, it is too tedious to start the fight to be interesting like the Black Witch, I, I don't know, maybe you have a better judgement than me, but uh, overall, horrible build-up and uh, an okay fight deserves a C tier. <sighs> Fortunately, we are at the final bosses, so they must be good, they are the final bosses for a reason, right? Right? Eh... So, the yellow king... Ah, uh, uh, god damn it. After all this time, we finally defeated the new gods. It is time to reach the other plane of existence and obtain the power to try to change something. But in that moment, Legard reveals he never had amnesia. He steals the throne and the spotlight from you, and ascends. You follow him shortly after, but it seems more time has passed, and after recovering all your party, you are ready to either kneel to him or to try to fight him. And I think you already know what happens when you choose to fight him. The premise of this fight in particular, in my opinion, is the best one of the whole game. Even though, let's be real, everyone already expected the plot twist knowing the character Legard was based on. And now, let's go to... the battle. So, the battle starts. This battle is... bizarre. Legard can either cast Black Orb or summon Asterisk on the field, which deal even less damage than Cave Gnomes. Okay, don't misunderstand me, Black Orb is powerful, but really? This is a final boss, and he summons these insignificant things instead of casting Black Orb? Did Ascend make you weaker? Also, the Snake, it uses Healing Whispers, which heals for a grand total of... Uh, 70 HP on average? What? what? What was the developer thinking? 70 HP? Guys, it's a final boss! The only thing I like about this fight is that he tells you he's gonna do the coin flip because he offers salvation or whatever, but... Uh, nah, 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 nah. C tier. I need some good bosses for a second. Let's go to Sylvian. On a higher level of difficulty from Terror and Starvation upwards, while redoing the normal procedure to reach Ascension, something is different. There is a new zone, full of green hue, and suddenly something approaches you from there. I don't know, it's simple, but I really like this build-up right here. And the fight itself introduces a lot of unique mechanics. The tentacles deal high damage, but they can also just not act. She is gonna entangle party members, blocking them for some turns. She can cast color from the unknown to reduce your mind to give you less possibilities to deal with her. And what I love is each tumor being able to have different attacks based on the shape of the character it takes. She also has a decent amount of HP, so you are surely gonna be able to see at least the majority of this stuff. And also you can experiment and understand that Locust Swarm is fantastic in this battle. So if you spend the resources getting Locust Swarm, you actually get rewarded for it. Isn't that right, Francois? Sylvian, because of this, is a solid A tier. And hopefully we are gonna go even better with Grokoroth. To reach this creature, you need to kill three purple organs scattered across the dungeon and traverse the final dungeon of the game, the Gauntlet. By this point, you already know you can't go back. You just delved too deep. You knew that going back was not an option anymore. You wanted to see what lies at the bottom, what's present at the end of the dungeon. And in the end, while you walk on the corpses of other stragglers, you stare into the darkness and gets reminded what is the primordial fear. Grogoth appears, immediately making Nazra explode, showing you his power immediately. Fantastic! No other words to say. And the battle is good too! Urgency, caused by the Whispers of Grogoroth, which is gonna kill one of your party members, or it's gonna give you a lot of reward if you experimented and know that Purifying Talisman heals the curse of Grogoroth. Also, not only Grogoroth has a terrific and powerful appearance, but he's able to back it up with facts. Claw of a God is a very strong physical attack, and is accompanied by an AoE burning gaze and the eyes that deal huge fire damage. Also, you cannot just evade all the attacks because you have a phobia from the start of the fight, no matter what, unless you have the ever-watching talisman equipped. And the amount of HP he has! Crazy. He is the true embodiment of destruction and actually means it. I consider it also the hardest boss fight of the dungeon. Now, with a lot of party members, all the battles are doable and kinda easy also, but with a low amount of party members, this one scares me a lot. 
S tier. And how can we conclude this tier list if not with the god of fear and hunger? After talking to Nilvan, she tells you she wants you to go to the Altar of Darkness with the girl, because this may open a new road, a change in the greater scheme of things, and also give new possibilities to humanity. But she never really tells you what's gonna happen once you go there, and that's probably because if you knew, you wouldn't have done it. And so the battle starts with an entity which soon will take the name of Fear and Hunger. The battle itself... Uh, eh... It's almost a glorified cutscene in the sense that it has five phases, of which the first one is nothing, the three phases in the middle are very boring, but I guess this time I can forgive it because those designs are so freaking cool. And the last phase maybe has the potential to be interesting, especially because this phase has 20 agility, so you will not have extra turns unless you combine the White Angel Soul and the Fast Attack. Also, she can stab herself automatically during the turns, so giving you more time to prepare. And there is a coin flip, which is kinda underwhelming, honestly, like, the guard was able to insta-kill you with his coin flip. This one, even if you don't guard, will not necessarily kill you, because it will deal huge mind damage or huge HP damage. But still, I I appreciate this fight. Maybe the developer was softer because you are supposed to only have three party members when fighting this fight because one is the girl, but I still think it could have been done better, and so I'm gonna give it a B tier. And I guess that's it for the tier list. You know, it's one of the first videos I do about just giving my thoughts on a certain topic, because the other tier lists I have on the channel are more objective than this. Like, you can quantify the utility of stuff such as skills or party members based on how many situations they are useful in and how often you get into these situations. But for something like bosses, I felt much, much more liberty. I'm pretty sure there is someone that is gonna put, I don't know, Yellow King in S tier or Cave Mother in F tier. And you know what? Tell me. Do you agree with my tier list or no? Let me know in the comments. Also, if you liked the video, be sure to leave a like and subscribe, because that's gonna help me a lot. But anyways, for today, I was for Apollo 94 and I will see you next time.